Hello. Special thanks to Ona Saber for sponsoring our 90,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details in the pinned comments down below. Our story begins inside of the Jedi Council chambers. The Jedi Council, for the most part, was apologizing to Ahsoka for their actions. Most of the Council was there, but there were a couple members who weren't, simply due to them being off-world. Katimundi, Mace Windu, Lo Koon, Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Anakin were all there. They told Ahsoka that they were sorry for what had happened. This offer was put on the table. If Ahsoka won the join, then she could rejoin the Jedi Order as a Jedi Knight. As Mace suggested, that while they were in the wrong, the Force works in mysterious ways. This could be seen as Ahsoka's great trial. Ahsoka wasn't exactly fond of the words that Master Windu used, but she was grateful for the extended apology. Well, as grateful as one could be when their life is put on the line for a crime they didn't commit. Anakin stood before Ahsoka as he told her that the Council was asking her back into the Order. He paused and told her that he was asking her back. He held in his hand the Padawan braid that was struck from her when she was removed from the Jedi Order a few days before. Ahsoka had already made her decision, and nothing could change it. She was going to close Anakin's hand and walk away from the Order. She reached out her hand and touched his metallic glove. She cut both hands around it and prepared to close his hand and push it away. As she touched his hand, she was sent into a terrible vision. She could see Skywalker marching in the Order, Jedi slain by their clones, the death of everything she loved, and at the end of it, what he would become. The shock from the vision sent her in a spiral and she almost stepped back. All of her confidence in walking away from the Order vanished and she feared what would become of not just Anakin, but what happened to the galaxy. She looked at the glove and kept her hands on it for a solitary moment. All her desire to leave the Order just sat in the forefront of her mind. She could hear children screaming and people crying. It was such a force that she grabbed the Padawan braid and smiled at her master. Anakin was worried for a second that she might not accept it, but he was relieved that she had. Master Yoda stepped forward and congratulated her on becoming a Jedi Knight. He then asked her to kneel. His lightsaber ignited, and he placed it at one of the end of her shoulders, and said the ceremonial words to her. As her being said, a tear slipped from her eye, and drowned in the floor beneath her. When she rose, she quickly wiped it away and thanked the council for their kindness, before bowing and scurrying away from the chambers. Anakin found this weird, but he didn't have time to catch up with her as she entered the elevator that descended into the temple. Ahsoka stood in the elevator and then fell to her knees. The weight of her actions made her feel as if there wasn't a choice she could make for herself. What she did was sacrifice the life she would have chosen for something she couldn't explain. Tears fled her eyes, a good portion of these tears for her feelings towards the Order, a number of them for the vision she had in that solitary moment, and then the rest for her confusion. There was a twist in her stomach and she used the wall to climb up to her feet and hold herself up. Her knees buckled and her legs wobbled as the doors opened and she made her way for her room. When she got there, she was sick. Not that there was much inside of her to spew out, but what was, was no longer there. She looked at her room, it had been wrapped up, for the most part. All of her personal belongings were gone, the mats, the sheets, they were all different. There was nothing of hers inside the room anymore. Of course someone would be along to bring back what was all of hers. Ahsoka walked over to a stand and placed her braid on top of it before falling down on the bed and weeping. She felt so much pressure and she didn't understand why. Ahsoka wanted to leave the Order, she just didn't trust them at all, but at the same time she couldn't even trust herself. That moment inside of the Council Chambers had her so unbelievably vulnerable, and she made the decision that a Jedi would make. She was more Jedi than she even initially realized, but it ate away at her. What was Anakin going to become? What was going to happen to him? Did she make the right choice? Her eyes filled with tears and she couldn't escape a guilt that washed over her entire body. A guilt for betraying herself. Ahsoka was able to eventually get herself up and walk to the food court and steal a couple things to eat before making her way back to her room and bunkering down for the night. Ahsoka didn't talk to anyone, but she was praised for her courage in the face of adversity. She just didn't understand. How could she? She was 16 and alone inside of the Jedi Order. 16 and accused of committing a crime that she wouldn't dare think of, let alone doing. 16 and a warrior, not a peacekeeper. How much of a travesty. At the center of all of that, she was there, alone, not knowing for an instant of who she was. Maybe she would find herself, but there was no guarantee that she would. Throwing her life to the Order and a code that she no longer believed in made her skin crawl and her heart break more. In the coming days, Ahsoka would find the ability within herself to interact with others, though the first person she went to was Master Plo Koon. She actually caught up with him right before he was about to leave and continue his campaign on Kato Demodio. Skywalker and Ahsoka started it and he was supposed to finish it. Also, it turned out that the 501st would soon be dispatched to Ringo Vinda to assist Masters Tip Lee and Tip Lar in their assault against the Separatists. When she caught Plo, she told him that she felt directionless. Plo understood. It was once her age, long ago. As close as they were, Plo knew that if Ahsoka stayed, she would find a lot of struggles, and he told her that the choice she made would be more difficult than leaving the Order. The point of him saying this wasn't to undermine her belief that leaving was a better idea. 
He wasn't saying that leaving the Order was the easy route or anything. It was more so that she would have to find herself as a Jedi within the Order and within the confines of the Order rather than going out and becoming whoever she wanted to become. What she did with herself would now be individualistic. She had to choose her path. She was no longer required to tag along with Anakin. That was a choice she could make, and Plo made that abundantly clear. He told her about some methods that could be useful. The one that stood out the most to Ahsoka was something called the Barash Vow. It was a vow in which a Jedi would cut themselves off from the Order and go out into the galaxy and become as connected to the Force as possible, allowing the Force to guide them down a path that they wanted to be on. This did seem interesting to Ahsoka. It could remove her from the active battlefront, but at the same time it didn't feel like the right path to be on. She thanked Plo for his insight, and he told her that he was always available when she needed him, if she needed him. She thanked him before he departed for the battlefront at Kid Modia. Ahsoka realized that there was much more that she wanted to say and even ask about, but she didn't get to because she was trying to get out her first initial thoughts, which were struggles of staying in the Order. She thought that perhaps she could get some answers from her former master. Ahsoka was eventually approached by Anakin as he asked how she was doing. Ahsoka admitted the truth, which genuinely surprised him. He told her that if she wanted, she could join him and the boys as they deployed the Ringo Vinda for the next battle, and on the way there perhaps they could talk things through. She agreed and went with him. When she went back to her room to get ready, all of her personal items had been returned and placed in the places they were before they were taken away. It brought a smile to her face to see some of the items again. She grabbed her Jedi weapons and left. Inside of the Venator, she and Anakin picked up right where they left off. She didn't feel like it was right to mention the vision to Anakin. She didn't want Anakin to feel like he was responsible for forcing her to do something she didn't want to do. She did tell him that she didn't want to be a Jedi anymore and almost left the Order, but she felt called to stay. Without knowledge on the vision, Anakin could only say so much to her about his thoughts and his ideas around her training and the personal betterment of herself, of course. Ahsoka was appreciative, but she still felt like she wasn't getting any sort of direction. Anakin was a great teacher and all, and he gave her some great insight, but the point she was looking for continued to evade her. When they arrived at Ringo Vinda, her questions still needed answering, and she was back to being a warrior. On the bright side, she was at least prepared for this, and as a Jedi Knight, she was respected as more than just a student, not that she wouldn't have been respected to begin with. As the siege began, Ahsoka felt that the war could genuinely come to an end soon. Maybe her disenchantment with the Jedi would cease once the war came to an end. Perhaps the war would end and the Jedi would go back to being peacekeepers. Of course, these thoughts of grandeur were drowned out by the death of Jedi Master Tiplar at the hands of Clone Trooper Tup. It was quite traumatic, because Ahsoka was standing right next to her, but she moved away at the last second. Not because of Tup, but because she was just trying to get some sort of advantage on the battlefront. The shot shocked everyone, and Fives was able to apprehend Tup. With Ahsoka on the front lines, the flank that Tiplar was at didn't crumble, so the Jedi were able to lead the rest of the assault. Anakin ordered Fives to deal with Tup until they finished everything. Fives took Tup away, and when the battle was over, Kix joined him to see what was going on. With Skywalker, Tipley, Ahsoka, Captain Rex, and Commander Doom, their assault was effective not to mention Skywalker's brutal murder of the Spider King himself. Ahsoka didn't see the events that led up to it, but she happened by the room when Anakin had thrown his blade through Chench's chest. It reminded her of the vision she saw inside the Council Chambers, and it frightened her. There were always signs of darkness of this throughout the Clone Wars. Without the vision, it never scared her. Now it did. Ahsoka would be the first Jedi to be where Tup was, at the back of the front lines. The medics had cleared up all the wounded and they were now collectively trying to see what happened with Tup. He just kept repeating the same phrases or words, good soldiers follow orders. That was the one he was repeating until he saw Ahsoka, and then he muttered out the word Jedi. He launched himself forward and Ahsoka used the force to stop him. He was sedated by kicks and the Jedi decided that he should be sent to Kamino. Ahsoka both told Tip, Lee, and Anakin that she would like to accompany Tup, Fives, and Rex to Kamino. Anakin nodded his head, reminding her that she didn't need permission to do that. She was a Jedi Knight. But he appreciated her for asking. Ahsoka smiled and joined the other three clones as they left for Kamino. While on Kamino, Tup would be taken in for examination, and Rex would redirect himself out to Ringo Vinda. Turns out there was a counter assault. With Admiral Trench dead, it didn't really matter. Though there was also a benefit to the death of the Spider King. Because he died, he couldn't reveal the details of Tup's betrayal to Dooku, which inevitably had a chain reaction across the entire Sith clan. While Nala Se and the rest of the top Kaminoan officials knew about the inhibitor chips, there wasn't any direct message from Dooku about the issue, and he was pretty adamant that he didn't want them contacting him. Though it's not like Nala Se or anyone else knew. Ahsoka and Fives came in with Top like any other battlefield injury. There was absolutely no reason to believe that it would be something to do with the inhibitor chip. So without Dooku knowing or the Kaminoans being aware that there was a faulty inhibitor chip, it went completely under the radar. The treatment for Top 
would lead Fives to removing his own inhibitor chip, especially when Tup died after his own was taken out of him. He told Fives about the nightmares being over. Ahsoka wasn't in the room for most of this. She was spending a lot of time with the Jedi Master from her home world, Shock T. Ahsoka felt like she could open up to Shock T about everything, and so she did. Shock T didn't really acknowledge the whole Anakin vision thing because she believed the bigger issue sat within Ahsoka. For what Shock T could tell is that there was some serious doubt within Ahsoka of who she was, and Shock T believed that the key to all this would be for Ahsoka to go within herself instead of searching around her. Ahsoka didn't understand. So Shock T brought her to a secluded area of the facility. She told Ahsoka to reach out, feel into the Force. Ahsoka listened and she felt out. Shakti began speaking to Ahsoka in a soothing but silent way. It was as if Shakti was speaking through the force rather than her mouth. She told Ahsoka to focus on her heart, not her mind, reminding Ahsoka that the mind can often dilute what the truth is. Ahsoka focused, her breathing slowed, and then she flew through the force. Shakti continued, telling Ahsoka to then focus outwards, not from her mind, but from her heart. She told her that if she followed her heart, then she could get what she wanted, and then she could pursue it. Ahsoka could see her abandonment of the Order first, but then it persisted further. She realized that leaving the Order was a code for her actually to do something else. It was an end to the Clone Wars. She was trying to escape the conflict, not because she wasn't strong enough to face it, but because it went against everything she was. She hated the fact that she was a warrior, and she always did. She hated that clones continued to die and be used as cannon fodder in a war that made no sense. She hated that the Jedi embraced the exact opposite of their identity. Shakti could feel the realization as it washed over Ahsoka all the dots connected within her. She didn't want to leave the Order, she wanted it to be resolved, but she believed the task was too large for her to do alone. Ahsoka's eyes watered and she opened her eyes. She turned to Shakti who placed her hand on Ahsoka's shoulders and spoke softly to her. She said that Ahsoka had the heart of a true Jedi. She was everything the Jedi were meant to embody. Shakti smiled and paused. She spoke up and told Ahsoka not to weigh the weight of the universe on her shoulders. She had already sown so much light into those she knew. She just had to believe that that light would trickle down through others. Ahsoka put her hand on Shakti's wrist and thanked her for her warmth. Shakti nodded her head and just reminded Ahsoka to persist. Keep persisting until that moment was right. Ahsoka paused and before she could ask, Shakti told her that she would know when she could take that first step. A sense of relief washed over Ahsoka and as she left the room she found Fives informing her of the inhibitor chips. He said that there was something going on here and that he had evidence to prove it. This wasn't the best time to say it though, because it was an earshot of Nala Say. Shakti had me leaving the room anyway, so she ended up hearing it as well. And she could also see the look in Nala Say's face. Firstly, Shakti, despite her worth and kindness, did not like Nala Say at all. Secondly, Shakti had no desire to allow Nala Say to have any control over the situation. She got between Fives and Nala Say informing her that they'd be taking the information back to the Jedi Temple. This wasn't something Nala Say was okay with because it would go to the Chancellor first. What a debacle. Neither of them were happy with each other, but the Chancellor would see it before it was shown to the Jedi for whatever reason. This gave Nala Say ample time to drug Fives, making him extremely out of it. The drugs intensified when Palpatine told him who he really was and how he can control the entire clone army. Through a series of convoluted events, Anakin, Ahsoka, and Rex would find themselves trapped inside of a Ray's shield due to Fives, who's rambling on about a plan and how Palpatine was in on it. There was something larger than just the Clone Wars and he knew it. The evidence was inside of his mind and it had to do with the clone inhibitor chips. They all listened but truthfully Anakin wasn't all that fond of Palpatine being accused of anything. That was a good friend of his and to accuse him of something terrible was like a personal insult. When Fox and the Coruscant Guard raided the room, Ahsoka saw Fives go for a weapon. Ray Shields resist the Force quite well actually, but she used as much of the Force as she could to push the weapon off the table. Instead of Fox seeing Fives as a threat in the moment that needed to be killed, he was stunned as he bent over trying to grab the weapon to defend himself. Ahsoka already wasn't fond of Fox to begin with, and so as he ordered the men to take Fives to prison, she interrupted and told him that Fives would be going to the Jedi Temple. Anakin tried to stop her, but she wasn't having any of it. Fox told her that it was per the request of the Supreme Chancellor, and Ahsoka told Fox that he was being taken back to the Jedi Temple regardless of that. Anakin had to get in the middle of it, as he told Ahsoka to stop. She didn't appreciate this either, as she informed him that per the deal on Kamino, Fives would visit the Chancellor and then the Jedi. That was going to happen whether he liked it or not. Anakin could see the fire in her eyes and so he decided to side with her. He told Fox that the Chancellor would have to wait for that to happen. Tell him that it was an order given by Skywalker. He would face the wrath of the Chancellor if Palpatine got upset over it. Anakin didn't want Ahsoka to feel alone in this, especially not against Fox. 
You could tell how much she struggled with being in the order to begin with, and for him, it was either betraying Palpatine or supporting Ahsoka. He just convinced himself it wasn't a betrayal of Palpatine, rather a simple change of their plans. He would make sure Fives went to prison, but first, let's see what he had to say. When they arrived at the Jedi Temple, they learned that Fives was drugged, which forced the Council to question everything more. First, the defensiveness of Nala Se, then the attack on Palpatine. What were they hiding? There was something big, and according to Anakin and Ahsoka, it was a massive deception. When Fives woke up, he confirmed that. Palpatine, on the other hand, was livid. He couldn't take his anger out on Anakin because he never did that. He was stuck in a bind, so he decided to call someone else to do his dirty work calling out to Count Dooku and General Grievous and informing them that the Battle of Coruscant was being moved up by a couple of months. As the orders were given, they began preparation. Truthfully, not the best idea. Most of the Council was on Coruscant. Also, it didn't help that the Council was getting to the bottom of the plot at the moment. While they didn't have the inhibitor chips that Palpatine had, they had fives and willing members of the 501st like Rex, Kix, and Jesse who were willing to offer up their inhibitor chips to the Jedi. As they almost got to the bottom of things, the Separatists arrived. The battle was massive, but with the quick retaliation of the Jedi, the Separatists couldn't capture Palpatine, though they did capture someone else. It was Padme Amidala, and this wasn't exactly the greatest decision on their part, because Anakin went from calm to mental case in the two seconds it took for him to learn of the information. Skywalker would be given permission to go to the Invisible Hand, as Masters Plo Koon, Windu, Kit Fisto, and Agon Kohler joined him. Ahsoka joined Sacy Tin as they actively prepared to defend the planet. Shakti stayed inside the temple with the recovering clones as the battle over the city planet intensified. Inside of the Invisible Hand, Dooku waited with Padme. He was essentially here to turn Anakin to the dark side, and then die. When the five Jedi landed in the hangar bay, there was a certain demeanor among the members that they were here to end the war. Windu took point of the operation, and he told the Jedi to keep a spaced out formation. Chances are the ship had ray shields all over the place. If the Jedi weren't careful, they could jeopardize this mission. Anakin and Plo were sent off to find Amidala, while the rest of them went for Grievous. At the top of the ship where Amidala was, Dooku was waiting. He was expecting someone like Skywalker and Kenobi but he didn't sign up for a fight with Master Plo Koon and Skywalker. While he did believe he could best Plo in combat, he didn't believe he could best Plo and Skywalker alone, so he decided against fighting them and opened up a trap door and slid through it, so he could get to the bridge and wait with Grievous. Truthfully, Dooku's senses were a little bit off. He couldn't even sense that Windu was here. Anakin looked at Plo, who told Skywalker to evacuate the vessel with the Senator. He would go and find the other Jedi. Anakin nodded his head as Plo booked it out of the room. Anakin and Padme shared a little moment until a miscommunication forced the Invisible Hand into a broadside from the two Republic Venators. The vessel was limping through space, and it wasn't going to last much longer. Anakin and Padme quickly found an escaped vessel and got out of there. At the same time, Windu, Fisto, and Kolar entered the bridge to find Dooku and Grievous. The ship was trying to flee the battle, but the Jedi had no intention of allowing the war to continue any longer. So, they ignited the lightsabers and engaged the Sith and the droid puppet. Windu and Kohler mounted up against Dooku, and Fisto used his experience against Grievous against him. Grievous wasn't fond of any of this. As their battle continued, Dooku bested Windu enough to force Ag and Kohler into the primary position for their duel. Windu decided that he would rip the ship apart from the inside out, as he told the other Jedi to evacuate. They didn't want to, but he made it clear that he was going to take both of them with him. Windu believed that he would likely crash the ship down somewhere in the industrial sector, just based off where they were going in the atmosphere. And that was right until Venator used his five cannon and ripped the hull apart as it moved downwards towards the surface. Windu used the force to crush all the panels inside the bridge, and he was actively keeping the doors locked, while buying his time against his two opponents. It wasn't easy, but he was doing what he believed was necessary. They were actively trying to kill him, but he did everything in his power to avoid that. Due to them not being strapped in, when the ship entered the atmosphere, they were all lifted up into the air and stuck to the ceiling. Mace then realized the horror of his decisions. Because while Palpatine was enjoying the beautiful Coruscant day, with the Scepter throwing the Jedi off the scent for a moment, he planned on sending bombers to the temple. Actually, Dooku was supposed to do that, until the Invisible Hand slammed down into the Republic Executive Building where Palpatine was. It was perfect, because it ripped apart half the building, the half that Palpatine was in. It was entirely accidental, but it did work out in everyone's favor. Dooku, Grievous, and Sidious were dead, along with Master Windu. With the Separatists' loss of Coruscant in the coming hours, the Republic would suggest an invasion of Raxus. This initially wasn't agreed upon, but Admiral Tarkin took the initiative on the idea and was given permission from the Republic High Command and the Galactic Senate to do so. While Sidious was gone, the Jedi did, in a way, understand that there was a greater purpose to the inhibitor chips, but they didn't get around to the fact that it was involving Palpatine. Ahsoka, after Coruscant, kept herself inside the temple. This lasted for a little while, but as she did, she felt a sense of comfort and relief. 
Also, it helped that the invasion of Raxus completely crippled the CIS and forced them into a surrender. The war was seemingly over. There were some rebel cells, but they would be ripped apart in the coming weeks. And months. Ahsoka as a knight decided to stay put until she felt called to leave. And when she did feel called to leave, it was to leave Coruscant. As a knight, she could go alone, but it was recommended that she take someone with her. Being that it was Ahsoka, she went by herself. There were plenty of friends that she could go with, but she had a certain level of comfortability with herself that allowed her to do it alone. When Ahsoka went out, she initially avoided conflict zones, but conflict always found her, which really left her distressed in her own way. Ahsoka didn't like violence, but she was forced to endure through it. None of these missions would include a run-in with Mandalorians. They tried reaching out to the Republic, but no one recognized the legitimacy anymore. Had it been Satine? Definitely. She was a real leader, and the people of a civilized galaxy adored her, mostly due to her resilience. With her killed off by her own people, no one could care about what happened to Mandalore. Many people inside the Republic hoped that Mandalore would eat itself alive, because they seemed to be a curse. They couldn't live with peace, so they destroyed the only foundational society they ever had. They threw away everything for nothing, and no one respected them. Maul knew this would happen, so he made fools of those who turned against him, and the Crimson Dawn ripped apart the structure of the society. It was horrific, but the 20 years of work that Satine did folded in under a year, and her sister? but was killed in action trying to undo what she helped set in place. At the end of the Clone Wars, Ahsoka watched her master become a member of the High Council. Master Skywalker couldn't be happier with the role, and into the position that was left open by Mace Windu's untimely death with Jedi Master Plo Koon. The Council slowly backed away, but didn't cut themselves off from the Republic. With Chancellor Argana undoing everything that was set in motion by Palpatine, there wasn't any real reason to back away. Actually, it had Yoda and the Council believing they should be more oversight of the Jedi in the Republic, and because Bail was so close with a number of Jedi, he actually supported the notion. Anakin, at the end of the war, had twins, but decided against leaving the Order, and he found it within himself to find peace with the Order. It was hard, but a great deal of it had to do with finally being welcomed into the High Council as a Jedi Master. It's something he always wanted, and he finally had it. Padme was alright with this, especially since she and Anakin were doing especially well with the secrecy thing. The end of the war only made it easier for them to continue the ruse. For Ahsoka, her life began as she decided that she wanted to delve further into the ancient Jedi teachings. She remembered Professor Hyang, and she went to him for some information. He gave her a list of planets to go to and told her what she would find at each of those planets. Ahsoka found that piece that Shakti told her about, and she loved it. Ahsoka's next few years would be of journey, excitement, and adventure. All the things that Jedi weren't supposed to crave, but the irony of it is that she didn't crave it, it just found her. And it can enjoy watching a student enjoy the life that she had in front of her because Ahsoka was always visibly happy. He was so glad that she decided to stay with the Order because he knew that she could find something she longed for so badly. When Ahsoka was finally 20 years old, she returned to the Jedi Temple for the first time in what felt like forever. It was close to around three years since she last set foot inside the temple. Anakin and her met on a couple missions outside of Coruscant, but Ahsoka was following a trail. She was doing investigative work. While she initially went out to learn about the Jedi and understand who the Jedi were or even their actual code, she ended up learning about something else. It was when she was on Jeddah that she learned about it. There was spice dealers that had a very large influence on unsupported sectors around the galaxy. While Jeddah was under Republic jurisdiction, it didn't have any representation and it barely got any funding. It was just simply in a sweet spot, where it was within the range of the Republic but not within their care. It sucked for the people, but the main point being that there was a criminal empire that had a lot of influence out here. Ahsoka took the information she learned on Jeddah back to Coruscant, where she found that this organization was on a much larger level. Upon her return to the temple, she told Terra Sanube about it, and they expressed that it happened. Typically, these little criminal empires would pop up, be really big, and then just disappear. It happened a bunch, but this was a post-war galaxy, and Ahsoka wasn't exactly confident with the belief that it would just disappear under its own foolishness or whatever. She thought that it had the ability to go on longer than most of those other organizations. Terra told her that he made sure someone looked into it on Coruscant, but he didn't promise her anything. She thanked him for his time and carried along with her day. Since she was inside the temple, she was visited by Grandmaster Yoda. He told her that he was proud of the progress she had made. This was of course in relation to what Shakti told Ahsoka years prior. Yoda was very aware of it, and he did try and keep knowledge on as many members as he could. It wasn't easy, but he was a Grandmaster and he believed it was his responsibility. Anyways, since she was here, he told her that if she wanted, there was a youngling who would love the opportunity to be her student. Ahsoka turned her head in a questioning way. She was surprised. She hadn't been here for so long. Well, it turns out there was actually a particular student who held herself back a couple of years because she wanted to be Ahsoka's Padawan. Ahsoka was shocked to hear this, but as it turns out, Katuni took a liking to Ahsoka and told her masters that she would wait three years to see if Ahsoka wanted to be her master. 
It was in the middle of year two, and she was still holding out hope. Ahsoka was kind of flushed because she didn't want Katuni to waste her time as a youngling forever, but she also didn't want to push this investigation on hold. Ahsoka told Master Yoda that if Katuni became her student, she was going to go back out with her on her investigations. Yoda smiled with a little twist of his head, calling her Master Tano and reminding her that as a master she could do whatever she wanted. Ahsoka's job dropped. Did he seriously just do that? Yoda left Ahsoka to her thoughts, and while it seemed like too much to put on her, she believed that maybe everything does happen through the Force. It reminded her of what Windu said after her trial. Perhaps he was right. As Ahsoka was regathering herself together, she had another visitor. Of course, it had to be him. It was Sky Guy, and he looked a little sassier than usual. He walked in and called her Master Snips. She rolled her eyes so hard she got dizzy. She questioned his seriousness, and he told her that if she was going forward with it, then she'd have a very happy student. Ahsoka sighed. Maybe she would. Ahsoka also shook her head. Yeah, she would have a very excited Padawan, wouldn't she? She had already made the decision to go forward with it, so that's what she did. When Ahsoka went to the youngling area, she found 15-year-old Katooning. She was giddy with excitement, and when Ahsoka came into the room, Ahsoka couldn't help but smile, as she told Katooning that she was her master. The young Jedi nearly jumped through the ceiling. She was so excited. She told Ahsoka that she was so ready for this as she got into a proper stance. Ahsoka bowed, as did Katuni, and Ahsoka waved on Katuni. She told her that her first mission would be outside the Jedi Temple. Not for nothing, Katuni was really excited because she was kind of stuck in here for those last two and a half years that she was waiting. When they entered their Jedi T6 shuttle, Ahsoka asked Katuni why she decided to wait for so long, and she told her master that she just felt a bond. She didn't want to miss out on it. Ahsoka laughed and then told her that she was missing out a couple years of doing anything else. Katuni leaned back in her seat and said that she knew. Ahsoka loved the attitude, so she told Katuni to strap in. The T6 lifted up and blasted away. Katuni asked where they were going, and Ahsoka told her student that they were continuing an investigation, though they were going to be heading towards the Outer Rim for a change. When the ship was in hyperspace, they spent time getting to know each other, and Ahsoka even asked about what form Katuni would like to use and learn. Ahsoka also apologized for the lack of formality in anything, but Katuni didn't care. She got the teacher she wanted, and that's all that mattered to her. The training would go well, but there were some things that Katuni was missing. It'd be alright though, they could work on it. Before they got to the Outer Rim world that they were trying to get to, they stopped off at a local station. Since Bail Organa became Chancellor and allowed more Jedi oversight into the Republic, there was a pop-up of Republic facilities across the Outer Rim. They took time to build, but they were funded by the corporations who fought against the Republic during the war. Yet, see, these corporations owned a ton of money for what they did, so essentially they were being forced to undergo the repercussions of trying to take over the galaxy. The Starlight Beacon project was reinstated around the Outer Rim, which was how the Republic was pushing itself back out there. The only issue was the clones. Not that they were bad or in trouble, it's just after the war, they realized that they were part of a plan to die. The documents surrounding the inhibitor chips were leaked. Long story short, the clones rebelled on Kamino and executed the Kaminoans. They then demanded that they have their inhibitor chips removed and be allowed to be free. The Republic used a good number of credits that were owned by the banking clans and then gave them to the clones for saving the galaxy. So because of that, there weren't a ton of clones left in the Republic. And because the citizens saw the clones as second-tier citizens until the end of the war, no one wanted to join the militias. The Starlight Beacons were the only front towards the Outer Rim. While it was known that the Nile weren't around anymore, it was more or less the concern of what their place was in this galaxy. Chancellor Argana didn't want to wage war on the Outer Rim because that was stupid, but he did want to get rid of the criminal organizations, but he just couldn't go after them without support. After a small docking at the Starlight Beacon, they went to Tatooine. It was seemingly the heart of everything. Jedi were a rare sight out here, so Katuni and Ahsoka wore garments that didn't belong the Jedi. And they went to Mos Eisley, one of the worst spaceports in the galaxy. It was crawling with pirate scum. A lot of them were pikes. This set Ahsoka off, but not Katuni. They continued through until they found a Katina and learned about how bad things were actually getting out here. Ahsoka also finally got a name and a logo. Well, two names. The criminal organization was called Crimson Dawn, and their leader was Dryden Voss, or at least he was a face of their organization. Though there was a commotion outside, it seemed as if there was a hostile takeover taking place, and a shuttle landed. Out from the shuttle walked a hooded man. Ahsoka pushed Katuni behind her. She watched the hooded man walk along the streets as he told people that there was a Jedi in their ranks. He wanted to know who the Jedi was so he could kill her. Maul knew that if the Jedi learned about Crimson Dawn, then his operations would be in shambles. The whole point of the operation was to try and coexist with the Republic rebuilding, and with the Starlight Beacons breathing down his neck, he needed as much room as possible. Ahsoka planned on keeping quiet until he began torturing people. Ahsoka turned to Katuni and got down on her level. She told her student to get back to the ship and radio for help. Don't do anything else. 
Ahsoka stepped out from the crowd and told Maul that it ended here. He turned and smiled. He didn't recognize this Jedi, but he was glad he had someone to kill. He told her that she could either die or join his side. There were riches that she could only dream of within his empire. All she had to do was surrender herself to the darkness and forget the Jedi. Ahsoka smiled as she unharked her lightsabers and told Maul that it ended here. He wouldn't continue to corrupt people around the galaxy. Maul smiled and told Ahsoka that he hoped her student wouldn't see it that way. Ahsoka's calmness dropped and she realized that Katuni was being set up for a trap. Ahsoka didn't even think about it in the moment. The T6 was what gave them away. It wasn't the questioning inside the cantina. Ahsoka turned back and Maul spoke to her with a madness in his voice. He told her that no one could save her student except for her. He told her that if she surrendered herself, then he would tell his men not to kill the young Jedi. Ahsoka stopped. She had to make a decision and her thoughts immediately went to Skywalker. What would Anakin have done? Anakin would have trusted her, right? Ahsoka didn't believe a bounty hunter would be there. Her hopes would just be that it was regular thugs. Ahsoka turned back towards Maul and ignited her lightsabers. Maul gritted his yellow teeth and ignited his own weapon. The crowd looked on with interest. A lightsaber fight is something they would never see before. Ahsoka launched herself forward and she was met by a Sith power. Maul confronted her as their battle was intense. The people watched in awe as Ahsoka held her own, but she had a wit to her. Oh, this was Kenobi's student. He may have not known, but she was pretty close. It made him hate her even more, assuming that if he could kill her, he could torture Kenobi more than he did with Satine's death. At the landing zone, Katuni was snatched up by a couple pirates who were ready to kill her. She used her acrobatics to get over them and ignite her lightsaber. She was quick on her feet, defending herself as best as she could, trying to do everything in her power to keep these pirates away from her. It worked well to begin with. Not for nothing, she was a Jedi after all. But the thugs kept coming and she began to get surrounded. Katuni turned around and saw that she was trapped. There were two exits and both were blocked off. The pirates told her that the boss wanted her dead, mostly because her master couldn't save her. Katuni worried about her master and her life until a blaster round shot off. Katuni's heart stopped. She looked back and saw two pirates drop to the ground, dead. Out from the smoke came a pirate that she was friends with. Katuni turned back and used the force to throw the pirates into the wall. Katuni looked back and asked what he was doing here. Hondo smiled. He told her that he was looking for some profit, and he couldn't help but notice the Jedi were here too. He told her a bunch of his men had left for Crimson Dawn. It was getting hard for him, so he needed some money. He looked at her and said he needed some help with the job. She sighed, and he said he did save her life after all. Katuni shook her head. She was thankful, but her master was in trouble and she needed to help. Hondo told Katuni that it wasn't a big deal. He could wait for her to send the message or whatever she had to do. So, yeah. Okay, whatever. She sent the message and then went to help Hondo with his little mission. Ahsoka, on the other hand, caught her breath. She hoped that her student was alright. She couldn't tell what happened. The force was clouded and it was mostly due to Maul's stench. He threw herself at her again, seeing that she had since staggered. Ahsoka was quick to keep her balance as she perfectly parried Maul, cutting through his lightsaber. He stumbled back and looked up. The twin suns blinded him as Ahsoka leapt through the air. Her blades dropped down and crushed through his skin, dropping him to the ground. The crowd went silent. The people who supported Maul were in shock. Ahsoka looked up and took a deep breath. Maul laid his head back in the sand and died in a short moment, almost like he was calling out for Mother Talzin to save him. She didn't, and he died like a rat in the desert. Ahsoka turned and quickly ran for the ship. This was troubling, Katuni wasn't there. But all the guards were knocked out, so what happened? When Ahsoka called out her student's name, Katuni came running around the corner and ran up to her master, telling her that she was so worried. Ahsoka asked where she was, and Katuni said that she was kinda held up. Ahsoka asked what that meant until she heard a familiar laugh around the corner. He was holding a couple briefcases and he was smiling cheek to cheek. He thanked Katuni and wished her well as he waved goodbye and vanished out the door. Ahsoka looked down at Katuni with a little confused look. She sheepishly smiled before telling Ahsoka that reinforcements were coming. Ahsoka was glad to hear that as the two of them made their way for the T6 and took off. Before they arrived at the Starlight Beacon, Ahsoka relayed the information to the Council about what happened on Tatooine. Maul was dead, but his criminal empire was still a threat. The Council explained that they would relay the information to the Republic in hopes that something would happen on a larger scale. Luckily, it didn't need to. The Republic fleet that was called for by Katuni blockaded Crimson Dawn and Tatooine. It would eventually lead to a confrontation that would invoke the public's interest in the Outer Rim. The reason is, a number of pirate fleets attacked. A Venator was destroyed, and the Republic was hellbent on revenge. Ahsoka, on the other hand, would continue her teachings for Katuni, especially the ones that involved not interacting with pirates called Hondo. The young Jedi excelled exponentially with Ahsoka and their bond formed. For a first mission, they wouldn't see anything as intense, being that Ahsoka technically ended the rule of the Sith. The Jedi were prideful in Ahsoka. She had done great service for the galaxy. In the coming years, 
Katuni would rise to the rank of Jedi Knight, and Ahsoka became a Jedi Master, just like Anakin. While Anakin had a large incentive to lead the Order, he never would. He loved it too much, just as he loved his happy family. When Ahsoka finished training Katuni, Luke and Leia were 9 years old, and they were exhibiting a lot of power in the Force. Though their father continued to teach them everything he knew and learned of the Force, Master Yoda at this point died naturally because of his peace, and as such he left the spot open on the High Council for Ahsoka to join. Opa Rensesis as the eldest member became the Grand Master, with Master Plo as a Master of the Order by his side, and they then welcomed Ahsoka into their ranks. The lineage of Qui-Gon Jinn was strong. Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, Skywalker, and Tana were all individuals a part of that, and surely Katuni would be brought up to this level someday as well. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan by this point were well aware of Anakin's family, and they did support it, however they also encouraged a revolutionary change within the Jedi Order, which was the expansion of it. In the past nine years, the Order had become more lax on individuals they let into the Order, meaning the temple was filled up with nearly 14,000 members. The Jedi decided it was time to build some new outposts, and as they did, they expanded outwards. With Grandmaster Rensesis and the relationship with the Republic going well, the Jedi finally became Knights of a Peaceful Republic. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Rai Rai 700, Darth Knox, Eternal Padawan, Jedi Sloth, Johnny Naguyan, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Mad Medi Studios, Anakin 003, Forda's Legacy, Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Youngling Slayer 66, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, Aaron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. If you like the video, smash the like button if you want to support me in other ways, or you want to see me read the list a little longer, why don't you go check out the Patreon? There's new updates for the Sith Clone Wars. We are six episodes in. There's some cool, um, there's cool stuff there for it. I'm super excited for you guys to see it. Anyways, let's talk about the story real quick. So this is a little bit longer, but I felt like this needed to be a little longer. The, the main point I wanted to get to was Ahsoka's journey as a Jedi further than Revenge of the Sith, and that was kind of why there's like an extra 10-15 minutes to this, because I wanted her journey to feel completed, I wanted there to be some satisfaction to it, I wanted it to be more than just bringing balance to the Force, or just getting rid of Palpatine, or whatnot. And so I felt like the battle, of course, not being rushed forward, was kind of an integral part, but the big thing that I wanted to do here was Ahsoka finding herself as a Jedi rather than finding herself outside the Jedi. And I believe that it would be harder for her to find herself as a Jedi, and that's something that I wanted the, uh, the theme to be throughout the video where she's consistently searching for a way to find herself, and she's challenging these other masters to give her an insight on how to find herself. And I think Shakti would probably be the best one to do that, because they're both from the same species. They probably understand each other a little bit better, and I think that dynamic worked really well in this video. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, uh, smash the like button. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.